I stand before you with two brown bags. In each bag contains an everyday household item, something that is pretty common in many of our households today. One bag contains something that we often take for granted, but something that if we don't have when we really need it, could end in a pretty catastrophic outcome. Can anyone guess what's in this bag? Toilet paper. <laughs> We've all been there. We all know that feeling when we reach for it and it's just not there, right? <laughs> and the other bag contains something equally as common, something that over three billion people in this world need or have needed at some point in their lifetime. But it's also something that's often taken for granted, but also sometimes that's withheld for one reason or another. Can you guess what it is? Hold that thought. I come from Denver, Colorado, the Rocky Mountain Wild West, a place where cattle still roam through the streets of downtown and cowboy boots are always in fashion. See, my mom was originally from Oakland. I came here through her. She was an officer in the military. At the time in Oakland, I was going through a pretty rough patch. My mom had recently gotten divorced, and she sought a different life, a better life for her yet-to-be-born children. So she joined the military. Our family had the opportunity to travel all over the world, learn from other cultures and communities. That life taught me to wander, to ask questions, to always give back and serve, and that our unique experiences and perspectives matter. So while I did not choose a life of the military, I did choose to serve in a different way. So I now stand before you as the first African-American LGBT person to ever hold office in Colorado. But why does that matter? I got to tell you, I see life a little bit differently than these guys. I chose to run for office not for the title, but because I thought my unique perspective, my unique voice, might add something new to the conversation, bring our communities together, and maybe make life just a bit easier for at least one person. But in order to do that, I knew I had to be honest with myself, my family, and my experiences. So, I came to the realization that I couldn't try to be those guys. Let's start with the obvious. I'm not a man, right? But who am I? What story do I need to tell? So see, when my mom left Oakland, she not only left her ex-husband behind, my oldest sister also chose to stay behind with her father. She soon thereafter got caught up in drugs and was in and out of jail. Part of my upbringing was taking care of her, making sure she had money on her books so she could have what she needed, and hoping that each time I saw her would not be the last. So when I ran for office, one of my major platform planks was criminal justice reform. You see, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world and women are the fastest growing segment of that population. So I thought to myself, what could I add to this conversation? How can I make a difference? What's something that those guys haven't thought of yet? And then it came to me. Tampons. <laughs> That's in bag number two. Some of you got it, I heard you out there. That's right, tampons. Can you imagine the look on the guys' faces when I went down to the well and started talking about tampons? I got to tell you, it was pretty awkward. <laughs> the word toxic shock is probably not strong enough. <laughs> so we began talking, and some of the guys said, why do we even have to talk about this? Some even speculated that a woman might hang herself from the string. 
we needed to talk. Women, the, the female incarcerated population has increased sharply. In fact, it has gone up 700 times since 1980. Women in prison face unique challenges, but I'm sure as you can guess, the policies that govern female inmates are written predominantly by men. So it should come as little surprise to you that the policies that literally govern a female's uterus is pretty clueless. While prisons are supposed to provide basic necessities, like toilet paper, prisons often limit or charge for necessities like pads or tampons, classifying them as luxury items. Which got me thinking about my sister. You see, when she was in prison, she worked. Often making less than a dollar a day. Buying a box of tampons at $8 or $15 a box was simply out of reach for her. It meant that she had to choose between buying pencils and papers to write letters to her children or to buy a box of tampons. It just didn't seem right to me. So I began to inquire about the policy, about its impact on female inmates. I learned a few things. I learned that female inmates had higher rates of vaginal infections. I learned that inmates would create makeshift tampons causing those infections. I learned that women, if they stain their clothing, would have to continue on in blood-stained pants and prove a medical necessity to a guard in order to get the supplies she needed often a male guard. I learned about the black market trade of tampons, that women were bartering them for goods. Some were even, even bartering sex with guards to get a box of tampons. Imagine the indignity. So why does this matter? 96 to 97 percent of all inmates return to society. A North Carolina, university study, North Carolina State University study found that there are four factors that decrease the recidivism rate in women, the likelihood that they'll reoffend and go back to prison once they're released. Two of those factors have a direct correlation with the restrictive tampon policy. Number one, a woman who is in good health, that means not riddled, with vaginal infections, is 50% less likely to reoffend within the first year of release. Number two, a woman who is in good mental and spiritual health is 40% less likely to reoffend within that same period. Now, you tell me how someone who is belittled and degraded on a regular basis, monthly in fact, would consider themselves in good mental and spiritual health. Now, I'm not saying that tampons will bring anyone closer to God, <laughs> but what I do want folks to consider is the fact that when we treat inmates as people, as human, instead of as animals that are in cages, when we do treat them as animals, as in cages, it has a detrimental impact on not only their mental state, but on our society and the safety of our communities. <laughs> Menstruation products should not be considered a luxury. Prisons need and should do more to prevent the unsanitary and dehumanizing situation whereby inmates lack basic necessities. Inmates are in the care, control of the state. When a state has restrictive tampon policies, it's mean it's care. That means its care is either non-existent or barbaric. We must do better. So, after enacting our non-restrictive tampon policy in Colorado, 
I went back to one of the women's correctional facilities. After hearing that I was the one who passed the measure to allow for tampons in prisons, they were elated. I got to tell you, it was pretty fun. I walked in there and I was like, you get a tampon and you get a tampon and you get a tampon. <laughs> We had a blast. <laughs> I never felt like a rock star till that day. <laughs> the women told me that they were so excited about the new policy. In fact, they told me it meant a lot to them. It told them that someone cared about them. Some even came to me and told me that they were looking at changing other policies in their, in their facilities because of this change. They felt like they could do better for themselves and for the people in there with them. I even talked to the ward and asked him what he thought. He told me that there had been zero negative impacts from the change. In fact, he told me that the unrestricted tampon policy actually improved relationships between the guards and the inmates. You see, this small change made a huge difference in so many women's lives. The cost, 0.004% of our prison's nearly $1 billion budget. Let's see that a different way. <laughs> That's the cost so that women could feel dignity and self-respect. We can and we should make tampons, like toilet paper, available to inmates. Not only for their health, but for their dignity. At the end of the day, it is our humanity that binds us together. When we have the opportunity to treat someone as such, as human, will we? We can and we must. Thank you.